Continuous integration as we know it is broken. Let's take a look at how. So continuous integration is this idea that before we want to merge new code into a code base, we want to run some assertions to make sure we're not introducing any catastrophic bugs or errors into the code base. Typically what you would do is use some service like GitHub Actions or CircleCI, and you'd use this service to set up a machine here based on an image, and then we're going to provide some steps to run those assertions. Now, part of these steps is we're going to have to do some setup, like checking out the repository, for example, or installing PMPM, or setting up Node, or running our install step. Once that's all done, we can start running all of the assertions here. Here, imagine we're using NPM workspaces, and here we're running all of the builds on all of our packages in the workspace, and then running all of the tests, and then running all of the lints, and then running all of our end-to-end -end scripts. And this setup looks pretty reasonable and pretty straightforward. There's only 29 lines of code here, and our assertion steps here are pretty straightforward until you get into some of the details. So for example, take this use case where our workspace actually has three packages, utils, front-end, and back-end. And because the way our build is set up, we actually need to make sure that utils is always built first before we can build our front end and our back end packages. So because of this, we actually need to start ordering our build. So here's where we have to start adding filters to these commands. So here we'll filter PMPM to first run the build for our utils project. And then we can add a command here to filter out for every project that's not utils to run their builds. And this is actually highlighting one of the first issues that we see with this approach which is that what we're defining here is not really what, but rather how. It's not that we're telling our CI script that we want to run all of our builds. We actually need to tell it how to run those builds, including which order to run them. And very similar issues start appearing once we start optimizing for performance. Let's say, for example, that CI is taking too long, so we decide that we want to break this down into smaller jobs. Right now we have the main job that's going to run on every pull request, but what we could do instead is instead of having a main job here, we could say, here's our lit job, and then we can copy all of this, paste it in and say, here's our unit test job, and then come down here and say, here's our E2E job. Now that we have our three different jobs, we can actually filter down the assertions, so we're only running a subset of these on each one of our different jobs. So our lint one, for example, can only run our lint. Our unit tests actually will depend on our build in this case. So we'll still need to run our builds first and then we can run our unit tests. Similarly, we'll have to do something similar for E to E. So here we can get rid of the lints and the tests, but we'll still need to make sure our build goes first. Now there's actually some optimizations here where we could have spun up a machine to run the build first and then use the GitHub action cache to store that as an artifact that we could then use once we start up our unit tests and end to end tests. But that's getting a little too tricky already. And I hope that kind of displays part of the issues here which is really that what we're doing inside of this file is describing the how and not the what, like we had mentioned before. And what we're seeing is even in the more minor adjustments here that we're trying to make to our CI pipelines, complexity is really exploding. And this is how we think continuous integration is broken. But now we get to the really interesting part where we actually show you how to solve that problem. And the way we think you need to solve that problem is by moving from the how to the what in two dimensions. And the first one is how your workspace is configured. Let's take a look at that same example that we had seen before. I've actually got one up on screen here, and I'm going to use some of the NX tooling to see the full project graph as described in NX. So here's those three projects we described, backend, frontend, and utils. And we can see that NX already knows about the relationship between these packages. And what's interesting is we never tell explicitly that frontend depends on utils. Instead, NX is able to infer this from looking at your source code. This is actually a very interesting dimension that we didn't even cover in the original problem, which is as your workspace grows and you add more packages or more projects to your workspace, you're going to need to maintain that how in terms of the build order unless you have some something like this, which is NX keeping track of those dependencies for you. And then remember, there are some details about the builds here. For example, the build for backend and for frontend depends on the build of utils. Right now, we know that the projects depend on each other, but how does NX know that these builds will depend on each other? Well, we can actually see that inside of our NX.json file. 
Inside of the target defaults from our nxjson file, we can actually specify that specifically here. This is saying that for any one of our builds in the entire workspace, every build is going to depend on the build of anything it depends on. Now this is setting a default for the entire workspace. We can also go into one particular project JSON file and override the specific project if one of these projects actually doesn't depend on the builds of its dependencies. But moving on here, we also mentioned that the test should depend on the build so that the build always runs before the test executes. And there is a similar requirement here for end-to-end -end tasks. So end-to-end -end tasks should depend on the build as well. So by doing this simple configuration, we're actually telling NX what our build depends on, what our test depends on, and what our end-to-end -end targets depend on. And NX is going to take that and build it into its graph. For example, right here we still see the project graph, but I can also say to show the task graph, and here we can focus a specific front end build, for example. Here we can see, as desired, the front end build is always going to depend on the utils build. And if we do one of the more complicated ones, let's say, for example, we want to focus the back end end to end target. Here we can see that NX will know to first build our utils project, then to build our back end project, and then to run our end to end target. So what's cool about this is this all enhances the local development experience. For example, if I want to run the end-to-end -end script for my backend project, or better yet, just run all of the end-to-end -end scripts that exist inside of my workspace, all I have to do is run nx run many dash dash target equals end-to-end. -end. And nx is actually going to take all of that complexity and order it for us locally. So in doing so, we've effectively switched from how to what in terms of our local development. But the other place where we're going to make this change is specifically inside of our CI. So to see how we go from a how to what in terms of CI, let's take a look at the ci.yaml file. You can see a lot of this is going to be the same as we had seen before. However, things get different after we set up our machine. You'll see here what we're doing is we're starting a CI run. We're going to distribute on five Linux medium JS machines. This is essentially using our cloud product to start running five machines now. And NX is going to use these machines as resources for us to run our tasks on. So what this means is in one command here on line 35, we're actually providing the what of what our CI should do. We can actually run all of our lints, all of our tests, all of our builds, and all of our end-to-end -end scripts against only the projects affected by the current PR. This is actually a whole other dimension that we didn't even attempt to solve in our initial CI YAML file, which is we probably want to optimize things eventually so that if all we're touching with the PR, for example, is our front-end code, we probably don't need to run any of the assertions on our back-end project. NX gives you these kinds of tools out of the box. But remember the problem of trying to distribute these tasks among different machines. Before we had to inform our CI how to do this, specifically to set up three specific machines, one specifically for lint and one specifically for test and one specifically for end to end. And we had to build into the jobs for each of the machines, the dependencies of those targets first. Using NX agents, we actually don't need to do any of that because as we had already seen, NX knows about how all those dependencies work already because we've already defined to NX the what of how these projects depend on each other and how their tasks depend on each other. And now in addition to defining the what of how our workspace works, we're also defining the what of how our CI should work, which is specifically that NX should run all lints, tests, builds, and end-to-end -end scripts for all affected projects and should distribute this evenly between five Linux medium JS machines. These two lines actually tie those things together so well that it's very possible that after making this change, we will never need to touch our ci.yaml file again, which in our mind solves the problem that we were talking about with CI. The complexity has stopped exploding and we won't need to further configure our CI as our project continues to expand. Let's go ahead and see edX agents in action. I'm actually going to jump into my app.tsx file so I can make a small change here at the bottom of our front end application. And now let me check out a new branch and let's push that up to GitHub. Cool, so if I open up my repo now on GitHub and I go to my pull request, we can see that example. Let's go ahead and create a pull request now. And here I can see if I go to NX Cloud, I can actually see this run in progress right now. 
So here we can see all of our tasks coming in. We can see uh, this is actually the only targets we'll need to run thanks to that affected command. If we scroll down, we can actually see how our agents are coming along in terms of being allocated so that we can use them to perform tasks. And we can check out the status of each of our tasks individually by coming to the run details view here. We can see here that actually our run just completed in 49 seconds. And we can see the results of each one of these tasks individually here inside of the task view. Clicking into any of these, we can actually see the individual output of that specific task. Coming back to the PR now, we can see that an NX Cloud report was generated for our PR, and we've got the green light to go ahead and merge our pull requests. So let's go ahead and do that. So essentially what happened here was NX knew about all of your tasks, we filtered it down using the NX affected command, and then NX Cloud distributed this between machines. Here's actually an even better view of how this is supposed to work. As you can see, NX Agents is distributing these things among machines, and built into this distribution is actually the awareness of how these tasks depend on each other. For example, you can see here that this end-to-end -end task is not going to run until the corresponding build is complete, and that's exactly what we want. And this is going to continue to work at any scale. However, there's an issue here that we didn't really encounter here inside of our example project, but that we found was actually a huge problem for a lot of our enterprise clients. And that's that what actually happens looks more like this. There's all your tasks, and usually your end-to-end -end tasks are this one task that stick out really, really long. And usually they always make it through your filters. Your end-to-end -end tasks are usually end-to-end -end because you want to make sure you always run them to make sure that the worst bugs don't keep showing up in your system. And this kind of messed up the distributed piece of it as well, because even distributed among three machines here, we can see that there's still this really, really long block. And this is where we see this really cool integration with the new NX Project Crystal that allows us to automatically atomize our end-to-end -end tests. One of the coolest things about Project Crystal is we don't need to manually touch our project.json files anymore in order to define targets. For example, this one is showing how we can use the Playwright plugin to automatically determine all of your Playwright spec files, and we're going to create an individual task for each one of those files. This has the effect of sharding out that really, really big end-to-end -end target and sharding it out or atomizing it into much smaller manageable tasks, tasks that can actually be distributed then against multiple agents which is a really awesome enhancement that you get just from combining NX agents with NX Project Crystal. We can also further enhance our CI by creating a dynamic chain sets.yaml file inside of our workspace. This will actually make it so that we can set a certain cluster of machines for smaller chain sets and a much larger cluster for our larger chain sets. And also we'll look at the number of tasks we need to run and determine whether we need a small, medium, or large here, and then allocate those machines dynamically per pro request. And this is really only just the start of what NX Agents is going to be able to do for us in terms of determining the correct amount and type of machines to use for a certain pull request. It's only going to get better from here. And finally, one of the things that we're shipping NX Agents with right now is the ability to identify and automatically retry flaky tests. The way that NX Caching works, we can actually automatically detect certain tasks as flaky by seeing if with the same source code, we sometimes produce different results. For example, sometimes we fail an end-to-end -end test, other times we succeed it. Because we have this caching information available to us, we've already automatically built this into NX Agents so that we'll automatically determine tests as flaky so that we don't have to go back to our ci.yaml file and try to define how to deal with flaky tests. Instead, NX is going to know the what, that this is a flaky test, and know to retry it automatically. So there you have it. Continuous integration was broken. We built NX Agents to solve it. And NX Agents is now available to all workspaces with all of the features that we covered inside of this video. You can find more information at nx.app including our pricing information here. Notice that there's a very generous free tier here that's great for open source projects. So go ahead and start taking advantage of NX Agents now. Keep working hard, y'all, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.